Oh, hi, everybody. <laughs> I've been having uh, difficulties. Uh, my colleagues have been uh, helping me out. Thank you so much, everybody, for dropping in. And uh, today, uh, I'm going to be telling you uh, some stories that come out of uh, the collections. And these are stories of how science fiction fandom has influenced popular culture. And uh, let's go ahead and begin. The first thing I'm going to talk to you about today is the phrase spoiler alert. Uh, you might not uh, think that spoiler alert is something that would have come out of science fiction fandom, uh, but it has. And it begins when uh, National Lampoon uh, comes out with their, uh, an issue in 1971. And in that 1971 issue, uh, Doug Kenny uh, has a, a great column and the column is called uh, Spoilers. And he actually begins to give away uh, secrets and the endings to some uh, really famous films like Citizen Kane and Psycho. Uh, he gives away the endings to some uh, mysteries uh, by Agatha Christie. And of course he says, you know, uh, he's saving people time and money. Now they don't have to see these things and uh, that he's doing it as a public service. So spoiler. Uh, the word spoiler is beginning an evolution. And this idea of a spoiler being someone who spoils things uh, has been growing. There was a Hollywood film called The Spoilers with John Wayne in it. And uh, uh, I believe Marlena Dietrich is in that movie as well. And uh, uh, it's taking on this uh, a new meaning. Uh, and uh, it goes uh, uh, through some changes and by the late 70s, uh, science fiction fan, author, reviewer, uh, Spider Robinson. Spider Robinson has a column in uh, what is sort of a, a pro fanzine, a semi pro zine called Destinies. And this is a, a fan magazine that's actually published by Ace Books as a paperback. And uh, in that, uh, uh, Spider Robinson uh, begins to use the words spoiler warning uh, before he gives away uh, secrets to films that he's reviewing. And actually, he's a book reviewer, so he's, he's giving away secrets to books. And lots of fans are reading this, and they begin to use this phrase spoiler warning when they're reviewing fan fiction. And it keeps changing. And at MIT, they sponsor a listserv. And you know, this was a, a, a very new thing at the time. Can we advance the slide? Beauty. 1979, uh, uh, at MIT, uh, uh, Roger Duffy is moderating the listserv, which is SF lovers, science fiction lovers. And his job is to take uh, uh, discussions and threads and organize them so that they can be sent out in a digest. And he begins uh, 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 to use this phrase, uh, 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 spoiler warning as well. And uh, uh, by the time we get to 1982, they're discussing Star Trek II, and this is the very first time that the phrase spoiler alert uh, arrives online. So 1982 is kind of uh, 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 the beginning, and, and uh, it's kind of amazing that it's only been around that long. But uh, what we have here, which you can see is a picture of destinies. We have, uh, I, I believe, at least three uh, uh, issues of Destinies that I know of, and we probably have more that are unprocessed. But this is volume one, number one, the very first one. And if you look down a ways, you can see Spider Robinson's name and his column uh, uh, was in Destinies, as I said before. Okay, uh, let's move on. The next thing I, I wanna talk to you about are, is the uh, rocket ship countdown. So the countdown that we all know so well, 10, 9, 8, and so on. Uh, the rocket ship countdown, you know, where does it come from? Uh, it comes straight out of fandom. 
So in 1929, uh, uh, Fritz Lang decides to make a, a movie called uh, uh, De Frau uh, im Mond, and uh, please forgive me, uh, uh, German speakers, uh, known in English as Woman in the Moon. And Woman in the Moon is a wonderful film. You can watch this on uh, YouTube if you want. And uh, it was uh, written by Fritz Lang's uh, uh, spouse at the time, uh, Thea von Harbo. And Thea von Harbo was also uh, uh, the author of Metropolis, another uh, famous uh, uh, landmark uh, science fiction film by Fritz Lang. So uh, Woman in the Moon, uh, uh, Fritz Lang you know, decides that they have to do something more interesting uh, than what they've been doing. So up until that time, people who were involved in rocketry, at least in Germany, were just counting uh, uh, up. So they would say one, two, three, blast off, or whatever they said, or one, two, three, go, or whatever. And for the film, Lang wanted something more interesting. So he said, you know, let's count backwards. What if we counted down? Well, he had a consultant, a rocketry consultant on, the, on this film who just happened to be uh, one of the pioneers of, of rocketry, and uh, uh, that's Hermann Olberth. Well, Hermann Olberth uh, uh, liked this, and he invited a lot of his students to come and see the film when it was done. And one of those students uh, was a, a, a big fan of rocketry and a fan of science fiction, and his name was Werner von Braun. So uh, uh, it, it, you know, really uh, uh, inspired uh, uh, Werner von Braun, who went on to become uh, uh, the, German, the head of the uh, German missile program and rocket program during World War II, uh, worked with the V-1 rockets and the V-2 rockets. After World War II, he comes to the United States and begins uh, the American uh, space program and rocketry program. And he brings with him uh, this thing that he and every uh, uh, young kid in, in uh, Germany who was interested in rocketry were now all using the countdown. And so he brings it to the US and to NASA and uh, the countdown spreads all over the world. And uh, again, something uh, out of fandom passes into popular culture and even into science and uh, legitimate rocketry. Uh, so I think that's a pretty amazing one. What you see here in the pictures, uh, uh, these are both recent acquisitions. Uh, neither one is processed as yet, but uh, the top one is the theater manager's brochure uh, for Woman in the Moon. These were beautiful uh, brochures filled with photographs. They all have amazing uh, 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 printed covers. This one is exceptional because you see all the wrinkles that are on that cover. Those are actually all raised up from the surface of the cover. So when you run your hand over the top of that uh, uh, brochure, you feel all the wrinkles of the paper that makes up that image. Uh, that was put out by the studio and sent to theater managers around Germany to uh, get them to show the film. Beneath it is a photograph of a book that I recently purchased, and that's the first English edition of Metropolis uh, by Theo von Harbo. And that came out in 1927, and uh, uh, we have that in special collections now as well. Okay, uh, let's move on. The next story is a much longer story than the first two. It's one that I, I've told many times and uh, usually have left out a lot of the important details. You'll be able to see a lot of those details in the slides. And I'm just going to uh, uh, lay it out the way that I have many times. So I think uh, most of us, I hope, are familiar with the propeller beanie. That's the beanie that's worn on the head that has a propeller on top uh, that can spin. And these have been around, uh, I know, since uh, when I was a kid. They were actually around from before then. But how long has the propeller beanie been around? And where does it come from? 
Uh, again, it comes straight out of science fiction fandom. So the propeller beanie uh, was invented by a, a fan, an artist, an author, uh, a very interesting guy named Ray Nelson. And Ray Nelson, who was only 16 years old at the time, uh, and this was in 1947, Ray Nelson's having uh, a science fiction meeting in his house, a regional meeting, and he's having it in his house. And there's a lot of other teenagers there. And they decide that they want to make joke photographs uh, that would look like the covers of science fiction magazines. And they decide to all quick kind of run around and throw very quick costumes together. So Ray Nelson, I mean, this is his house. He goes into his uh, uh, bedroom slash studio and begins to throw things together. And uh, as he said, uh, uh, it was made out of pieces of plastic, a bit of coat hanger wire, some beads, a propeller from a model airplane, and staples to hold the whole thing together. So he puts this on and comes back out, and everyone is just so impressed. And one of the people who's really impressed is another young fan named George Young. So George borrows the propeller beanie, and he wears it to uh, a, a big convention, a world convention in Detroit. And at this world convention, hundreds and hundreds of people, probably a couple of thousand people or, or, or a bit over a thousand people at that convention, and they all see George for three days walking around with this propeller beanie on. Don't forget, no one has ever seen one before. And everyone is just so impressed by this. And they all take off to make their own propeller beanies. Okay, uh, uh, next slide, please. So, you know, uh, uh, in fandom, things just spread so fast. And then don't forget, Ray Nelson is also a major fan artist. So Ray immediately begins to make drawings of fans wearing uh, uh, the propeller beanie. And this spreads among fan artists. So you have, and I'm gonna do some name dropping here. Uh, you, you may, most of you will not know these names or recognize them, but famous fan artists like William Rotzler and Adam and uh, uh, B. Joe or Barbara Joe Trimble. Uh, uh, they all begin creating characters who are fans who wear propeller beanies. So in the illustration you see here, which is by Ray Nelson, you have two fans, they're holding dowsing sticks. So for anyone who doesn't know, a dowsing stick is a stick that you hold in front of you and you walk around and if there is water underneath you, the dowsing stick is supposed to point down and uh, show you where the water is. It's, it's a sort of a, a, a folk uh, a method for discovering water. And they're both holding dowsing sticks and they're both wearing propeller beanies. So by this time, anyone who's wearing a propeller beanie is considered a science fiction fan. And they're both wearing them. And the caption reads, what a small world. I read analog too. Analog being the title of one of the most famous uh, science fiction magazines. So uh, Ray's drawing these, uh, uh, making these drawings. Other people start to make these drawings and Ray Nelson uh, visits relatives in California. While he's in California, he hears about a contest. The contest is to create a character that will be used in a television series and uh, uh, people are invited to send in drawings and ideas for characters. So naturally, Ray Nelson sends in an idea for a character, uh, a little boy named Beanie, and he wears a propeller beanie. And he wins. He wins the contest. Uh, next slide, please. We're going to move ahead now and like a year maybe rolls by and a television program begins in California 
that shows in the Los Angeles area, and it's called Time for Beanie. And the Time for Beanie show is a huge hit. I mean, it's bigger than anything we can think about today. The show is also 15 minutes long. These are 15 minute segments of a puppet show. And the, uh, uh, the viewing audience surpasses at times uh, a Super Bowl audience. That's how many people are turning into this. It was created uh, by Bruce Sedley and Bob Clampett, and the puppets were voiced and controlled by two uh, young men who go on to have amazing careers, and that's Dawes Butler and Stan Freeberg. Uh, uh, Dawes Butler, uh, uh, and uh, this is you know one of those lists that uh, I could never memorize. Dawes Butler was the voice of Loopy the Loop, Wally Gator, Yogi Bear, Hokey Wolf, Elroy Jetson, Quick Draw McGraw, Snagglepuss, Huckleberry Hound, and probably you know thirty to fifty more uh, uh, characters. Uh, he worked primarily for Hanna Barbera. So anybody who's watched, you know, Hanna-Barbera cartoons from the 60s, 70s, well, 50s, uh, 60s, 70s, uh, you were listening to Dawes Butler over and over again. So Dawes and Stan start out, and you can see the picture here. They start out uh, doing this, and they're, they're following scripts. You can see what the puppets look like. They're following scripts, and the scripts are written by Bob Clampett. And they are ad-libbing like crazy. And both uh, uh, Dawes Butler and Stan Freeberg, these are extremely witty guys. And the ad-libs that they're coming up with, uh, this, the show uh, was on uh, uh, all, every day of the week. And, you know, they were just, a lot of the time, just kind of winging it. And the shows are brilliant. And you can watch Time for Beanie on YouTube. And I'd also recommend that you take a look at a, a, a video uh, where Stan Freeberg talks about Time for Beanie. And he tells a story uh, uh, in there about Einstein uh, that I'm gonna tell you in just a minute. Uh, we're, I know that I'm at time already, so I'm gonna just really speed this up. You can see a painting there of a little boy who's up in the air with a, a, a propeller beanie on his head. Uh, this was done in 1948, uh, 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 right in between uh, the creation and, and the television series. And this was done by Guy Penet Dubois, and it became a, a, a fairly famous uh, painting at the time. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Okay, here you can see what Time for Beanie looked like. Uh, uh, you have Cecil the C6 Serpent, and on the right, on the far right, on the far left, we see Beanie uh, as conceptualized by Ray Nelson. So Ray Nelson is back in the story, right? Because he won the contest to create a, a cartoon character, and Beanie was the character he, cr he created, and Time for Beanie was the show. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Famously, uh, 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 I want to tell you the, uh, the Einstein story. So Seberg, uh, a Freeberg rather, sorry. Stan Freeberg tells the story that uh, Einstein was a big fan of the show, as were a large number of celebrities. And Einstein is in a, a very important meeting at Princeton. And Einstein lived in a house on Princeton's grounds. And during the meeting, while he was speaking, he kept uh, uh, looking at his pocket watch, pulling his pocket watch out and looking at it. And uh, all of a sudden, he said, uh, 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 ladies and gentlemen, I am very sorry, but I must leave. It is time for Beanie and Cecil. And he got up and left uh, the meeting. And uh, again, this is a story told by Stan Freeberg. Uh, um, he may have stretched the truth a bit there. Uh, I, I'm uh, just relating uh, what I know. Uh, uh, yes, I'm a common beanie boy. Hi, Greg. Hi, Greg. Uh, uh, Greg Crickman uh, with us, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, fantastic. 
So uh, uh, by 1958, the propeller beanie is such a huge part of American life that it's featured in the American Pavilion at the Brussels uh, Fair. Uh, in 1962, Bob Clampett, who worked on Time for Beanie, brings Time for Beanie to television. He changes the name to Beanie and Cecil. It's a Saturday morning television, uh, kids television smash hit. People all over America begin using the catchphrase, uh, DJ, you dirty guy. And uh, uh, the phrase that uh, Greg just put in there, uh, I'm a common beanie boy. Uh, it's, it's hard to really know who the star of uh, Beanie and Cecil was. Was it Beanie or, or was it Cecil? Uh, definitely both uh, uh, co-stars. Uh, and, and, you know, the only real change was that uh, Beanie's Beanie, the propeller of Beanie's Beanie, uh, would allow him to fly so he could fly now. And Ray Nelson, uh, Ray Nelson said famously uh, he, never, he never bothered to patent it and he never made a dime off it. And uh, he did go on to write some interesting books and, and some popular books and, and became a, a fairly well-known author, uh, 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 won some awards. But, you know, he said uh, uh, late in life that he probably would be uh, most famous for inventing the propeller beanie. And uh, anyone who knows the story uh, would probably agree. So uh, questions, please. Thanks so much. And questions, please. Yes, want to learn more. Uh, you can take a look at these things. Uh, we're recording this, so you can take a look at this later. Uh, anybody that wants to talk about any of these things, learn anything more about what we have in special collections relating to anything, special collections, popular culture collections, happy to talk to you at length, uh, as anyone will uh, quickly attest. And uh, this is uh, the outside of my office. No, unfortunately, uh, uh, you're probably not going to get to come and see me, uh, perhaps by appointment. I'm not sure how we'll work it out, but uh, uh, get in touch and we'll see what we can do.